Hi, listeners. We recorded this episode before the ceasefire in Gaza collapsed in the early hours on Friday. Israel has now resumed combat operations in the Gaza Strip after blaming Hamas for launching rockets on southern Israel early morning on Friday. There are reports, however, that Israel and Hamas can go back to the truce. We still think our conversation from yesterday is relevant, and we hope you agree. Here's the show. You know where is your child sleep, but I don't know. I don't know if he sleep, if he eat. The only thing I know is that my son is kidnapped. I want my baby back. I want my son back. I'm David Knowles, and this is Battle Lines, Israel, Gaza. Israel, Israel. אנחנו במלחמה, לא במבצע, לא בסבבים, במלחמה. And like, maybe one day I'll end up like them, but it's a really scary thing for me. <laughs> People telling me that, you know, mostly this is about Hamas, but they're also angry with absolutely everybody. I'm begging the world to bring my baby back home. In this episode of Battle Lines, I speak to Middle East correspondent Natalia Vasilieva and senior reporter Henry Bodkin, both on the ground in Israel. We also hear from an Israeli hostage's mother who makes a heartfelt plea to get him back. It's Friday, the 1st of December. Natalia Vasilieva, could you talk us through the most important stories of the week as you see them in Israel? Hi, everyone. Obviously, the biggest story here so far is the continuing release of Israeli hostages in exchange for a ceasefire in Gaza and the partial release of Palestinian prisoners. So on Thursday morning, late Wednesday night, it looked like the ceasefire was about to collapse. Just to bring to bring in some context, the original deal only provided for a four-day ceasefire. And uh, subsequently, mediators like Qatar and Egypt um, that helped to bring the deal between Israel and Hamas managed to convince both parties to, to carry on with it. The original deal was to focus on women and children. And Hamas have been releasing about something like from 10 to 16 hostages every night. And on Wednesday nights, there were some concerning reports suggesting that Israel was not happy with the prisoners list this time, whereas Hamas was claiming that it didn't have any more women and and, uh, children to trade, and it only had something like seven women to release. At the same time, Israeli officials have been saying privately that they know for sure that there are more hostages in Hamas captivity, and namely women and and children hostages. And these are not just allegations, but it, it is something that is based on testimony from the hostages who had been released, who would be able to verify and say, you know, we saw those other women, they were fine, they were safe, um, so they they could be released. So on the one hand, the ceasefire is still on. Um, There is still a discussion about how this deal can go on. There were some suggestions yesterday that Hamas might be willing to start releasing elderly men. There's a few octogenarian men in their captivity and send civilians, civilian men. But again, we're at this point when... um, It's been seven days since Israel stopped its ground operation in Gaza. And all of the while, Israeli politicians have been very insistent, saying that we didn't stop, that the war is going to go on. And their goal, which was to, as they put it, uh, decapitate Hamas and essentially wipe out the Hamas leadership, this goal has been achieved. Yes, they, they, they claim some progress in the north of Gaza. They effectively took control of large swathes of, of Gaza, especially in the north. But Hamas leadership is still there, including the man, Ahya Sinwar, that they are negotiating with indirectly. So we're now at this crossroad where we're going to see what, what is going to outweigh in this debate. Is it going to be Israeli public, which is getting increasingly focused on the prisoners released, and it might be that Israeli public opinion will sway towards a a longer ceasefire if there is a chance to release more Israeli hostages. 
And Natalia, you've been covering the stories of those released by Hamas. What can you tell us about what they went through during their captivity? Yeah, it was it was really interesting to talk to the families of, of some people who expected that their relatives would be first in line to be released or they, they were surprised that they were released that, that early. For example, there's a young guy, a um, dual Israeli-Russian citizen who was released and no one expected to see a- any man to walk out of captivity and, and he did. At the same time, it's just recently that we saw some very frail and er- elderly women walking out of Hamas captivity, obviously someone who should have been released in the first place. The hostages themselves are not talking yet, so I was only able to speak to their relatives. And it's quite astonishing what they describe about how their family members have been coping with that horrific situation. You know, you might imagine that an 80-something woman in captivity would have a very hard time and like someone much younger and uh, let's say healthier and, and robust would would have it easier. And it was very interesting to speak to the family of Ruti and Karin uh, Mander, who are um, mother and daughter. The mother is 78, the daughter is 55, and um, Karen also has a nine-year-old son. I spoke to Karen's cousin, if, if I remember that correctly. And uh, she said that she was astonished by how resilient her aunt was, that 78-year woman. We saw pictures of her walking out from captivity, holding a hand of an IDF soldier, smiling, you know, looking very much energized. And they told me that it looks like the captivity took the worst toll on the younger. And somehow that, that older and frailer generation turned out to be much more resilient. In terms of conditions... Overwhelming if there are no reports of physical violence, but there are reports of very sparse conditions. People had to sleep on benches. They didn't have mattresses. They didn't have any blankets. Food was also very sparse. And from what we can understand, they originally were giving more food than later, which corresponds with the Israeli operation in Gaza when food supply chains were greatly disrupted. But at the, at the same time, there are reports of violence beginning to emerge. For example, there's a um, French-Israeli aunt of a teenager who was released recently who said that her nephew has been, has been beaten. We're not sure if he was beaten in captivity. What she suggests is that he was beaten on arrival in Gaza by someone that he describes as civilians and also given very little food and generally subject to emotional abuse. Apparently, his captors even forced him to watch a video of Hamas atrocities in the kibbutzim, which is the first case of that of that kind that we've heard so far. And Natalia, one more question before we go to our senior well, reporter, Henry Bodkin. What do we know of the captives who are still in Gaza? Well, I'm, I'm personally in touch with a few families, and they, they all have no idea if their family members are dead or alive. Some of them would think they're alive because they saw videos and pictures of them being kidnapped from southern Israel, but we don't know what's happening with there now. The youngest hostage in Hamas captivity, 10-month-old Kfir, uh, his four-year-old brother Ariel, and their parents are still in captivity and they haven't been released. And anyone would think that the infant would be the first to go. And um, it was just Wednesday night when... Uh, Hamas's military wing announced that the family has been killed by an Israeli strikes. The baby's extended family don't quite believe it. I, I spoke to a cousin of the baby's father who said that he thinks that it's just Hamas's psychological games and they're trying to manipulate the whole hostage exchange process. On the other hand, I'm also in touch with the family of one young woman who was kidnapped from one of the kibbutz in, in, in the South, and they haven't heard anything from her. She, you know, because because she, she, she's a woman and Hamas pledged to release all women, she should have been home by now, but she still hasn't been released. So there's a lot that we, we, we don't know about the hostage's condition. There was one case early on when a female IDF soldier was taken into captivity and Hamas claimed that she was killed. But at the same time, Hamas also released a video showing her dead body so that public can be reasonably sure that they were not just holding her. Now, we haven't seen any kind of um, evidence for um, the family of the 10-month-old Kfir. So to his extended family, that, that still gives some hope that they're still alive. Thank you so much, Natalia. 
Henry Bodkin, you've been spending many days now in Israel. Can you tell us a bit about where you've been and what you've seen? I understand you've been up north. Yeah, hi. So last week I visited the northern border, the Lebanese border, where since pretty much the day after the October 7th massacre, Hezbollah have been sending over munitions south, rockets, anti-tank missiles, mortars and, and suicide drones mainly. They haven't formally declared war on Israel. There was a there was a big speech, a much anticipated speech by Nassam Hasrallah about a month ago where he 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 kept his options open, but he didn't declare war. He he wants to show solidarity really with their their brothers in Hamas. So so the IDF up there, uh, essentially, they're in a quite unusual position for them in the sense that they're just playing a waiting game. They're, they're in a purely defensive posture yeah, up in those hills. And essentially, the dynamic that, that we discovered when we visited was that they're, they're trying to keep a lid on it. They don't want a proper war with Hezbollah. I don't think Hezbollah really wants a proper war with, with Israel at this stage. Biden has has begged them, has begged Benjamin Netanyahu to, to try to keep a little bit. The IDF had some casualties in the, in the opening weeks, some sort of lucky hits, as it were, by by Hezbollah. And so basically, they've kind of gone back to soldiering 101. They're taking a lot more care over the uh, over the basics of soldiering, really camouflage, digging, quick communications to make sure people take cover when there's incoming fire. And they, and they haven't had any casualties for for several weeks now, and and, and that's really important because the worry is that it, it wouldn't take much, perhaps a couple of multi-casualty hits, an armored personnel carrier being hit by an anti-tank missile, something like that, that would perhaps mean that the Israeli government feel they have to respond. That then escalates. There are then hits on civilian targets, perhaps in in Lebanon, or significant civilian targets. There have already been a, a few hits. And, and, and then, you know, Perhaps if there was a bigger response, that that could spark the regional crisis involving Iran that that everyone's afraid of. So we visited, and and the the guns were firing the Israeli artillery, but you 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 couldn't see where they were. The hills there are festooned with artillery, with tanks, command posts, but they're they're properly dug in now and and, and very well camouflaged. And and we met the local colonel. He's actually from the kibbutz of of Elon, which has been abandoned along with. All the Israeli communities are, are along the border, and he w- he was saying that actually, how a couple of weeks into the conflict, they found and, and printed off a, a, a defunct platoon commander's handbook that had been published in 1956, and based on lessons from the Second World War, and they'd be d- distributing them to the troops, basically saying, look, you you actually need to get back to basic old-fashioned soldiering, digging, concealing, etc., because we can't afford casualties. And, and saying that that it's been quite successful, and so they're, they're mainly reservists up there. A lot of them are from the north, so that presents challenges because they're trained to to go on the offensive. In two thousand and six, the IDF went into southern Lebanon very quickly. It was very kinetic, but now they're basically waiting, and so the officers have to keep them focused, have to keep them disciplined, and and as I said, just basically keep them out of harm's way from all this incoming munitions from Hezbollah, which which ha- has been coming in on, on roughly a daily basis. I mean, dozens and dozens of rockets on the day that we were there. Hezbollah has been adhering to the ceasefire, the, the, the Hamas-Israel ceasefire, or temporary ceasefire, I should say. It, they're, they're not a party to the talks, but they have said, and in the last few days have demonstrated that they they, they would down weapons, as it were, along with Hamas, Netanyahu's basically said, well, you know, that's fine. We don't have any deal with you. If if you don't shoot at us, then we've got no reason to shoot back. So it has been quieter there over the last few days. Thanks so much for that, Henry. Could you give us a little more detail on the countryside that you visited that all this all this fighting is taking place in? I ask because we've spent a lot of time talking about the about, about the battles in Gaza, incredibly built up, huge numbers of civilians. How is this different? Yeah, I mean, it, it couldn't be more different. Um, the, the first thing to say is it's absolutely stunning. It's um, dramatic rolling hills with ancient forests, orchards, groves, high ridges, rocky outcrops. A lot of holidaymakers go up there, rent cabins. It's a short drive down to the sea. So it, it couldn't be more different from Gaza. As with the area around Gaza, 
though there are lots of these kibbutzim, these these Israeli communes. The one we visited, uh, Elon, it was it was actually established about a decade before the the formal establishment of the state of Israel, mainly from Polish Jews who who were emigrating due to anti-Semitism and, uh, and and what they saw coming, and the, the land was actually had, had been written off by the the British mandatory government there as uncultivatable, but they they proved them wrong, and it it, it really is a, a lovely, stunning place and we went there a couple of days after there'd been this very very heavy rain so the the atmosphere was crystal clear there wasn't the usual dust that you would see there so you could really really see the Lebanese high ground the Israeli high ground plunging valleys and so militarily that means that eyes in the sky are, are more important than ever the Israelis need to be able to ideally spot suspicious movement in those hills before any incoming comes over, but certainly to identify the source of any Hezbollah firing very, very quickly after it's taken place. So they're they're using surveillance drones. Hezbollah tried to take one of them out last week, but but the Israelis then intercepted that surface to air missile. I think in terms of the individual troops, it's so the, Hezbollah has has rockets, as as Hamas has rockets. A lot of these are taken care of by Iron Dome, uh, which I'm sure you you talked a lot about on the podcast that the super sophisticated anti-rocket defense shield the anti-tank rockets you fired by a, a person on the ground you, you need line of sight for that so if, if if hezbollah fighters can get into a position where they can see israeli troops or an israeli israeli armor vehicle and point it at it then that's really problematic for the idf because because they're they're very very nasty they can they can pack a real punch and and there's nothing Iron Dome can do about it. It all takes place too low. Similarly, mortars, not not a particularly sophisticated type of munition, but if if you get them firing towards IDF troops who aren't in their foxholes, then then suddenly casualties will come out of very quickly. And so for the first time in in years, they're they're carrying whistles. So the first soldier who hears mortars coming in, rather than getting on the radio and having to formulate the militarily correct radio message that goes around he just blows the whistle and then all the troops in the nearby wooded area can can hear and, and, and take cover so the landscape is is affecting the tactics i'd kind of characterize it as a, a kind of cat and mouse battle um skirmishes really but but i mean it, it couldn't be more more different from gaza and israeli civilians they've been Evacuated and they're they're kind of decamped en masse to these big hotels in towns like Tiberias on the on the Sea of Galilee and uh, uh, and others. And Yoav Gallant, the um, the Israeli defense minister, w- w- was up in these hills last weekend and he said, "Oh, you know, we've we've pushed Hezbollah back. We're having great success here." And uh, a chap called Moshe Devadovich, who's who's one of the community leaders, he he said, "You must be hallucinating." Basically, the point he's making is that. Even if this quietens down, after what the people in the north witnessed happening to Kibbutzim in the south around Gaza with the Hamas massacre, they're going to need a lot of convincing to come back. Because, I mean, rockets, maybe the odd mortars, that's one thing. But what they really, really fear is a ground infiltration and a massacre. They think that there's no reason why Hezbollah wouldn't do that. And so it raises the question of, is the IDF going to keep really quite a large number of troops in these hills indefinitely, monitoring, surveilling, being ready to counter that threat? Uh, and if not, well, are the civilians ever going to feel comfortable coming back to their lands? Henry, you've mentioned the IDF and spoken a bit about talking to these soldiers there. Could do you give us a bit more of your impressions about the troops you met? Are they young? Are they old? Um, do they seem in good spirits? What were they telling you? The troops seemed a mixture, to be honest. There, there are quite a lot of young men there, pretty much all reservists. I think the the, the full timers are mainly down in the south, fighting the the really kinetic battle in Gaza. We were shown round by a colonel who was full time until 2015. He, he's a resident of Elon, so he's, he's now back in uniform, given what's happened. And um, so so he so he's a reservist. I think basically he 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 was actually quite interesting in his conversations with us he said is that you have a lot of passion with these troops because they're defending their homes you know in his case he he literally was standing in his kibbutz 
but but it's it, it's their region anyway if even if they're not literally physically stationed in, in the village that they grew up in so th- there's a huge amount of motivation which is obviously crucial with with any kind of military endeavor but but they are reservists and this isn't a, a, a quick operation it's all about sticking it out for the long term um, as I say a defensive posture and discipline and the winter's coming in and it's you know it's not a European winter but it has its hardships up in those hills and so th- there definitely is a is a focus on trying to keep these troops who a, a lot of whom live reasonably comfortable western style lifestyles these days d- despite the fact that the area is still quite agricultural keeping them focused and keeping them going so a mixture of of young and I wouldn't say middle age, but but not so young is the impression we got. We've heard a lot from many of our reporters about the anger in Israeli society towards the government and their handling of this war. Is that something you've picked up as well in, in your travels? You pick up a, a real mixture. I mean, it, it, th- there is a huge amount of shock and, uh, and outrage. And I think I, I get the sense that th- th- those voices that are sceptical about the operation in Gaza or, or, or indeed or would be outright critical about things like the, the massive humanitarian cost to the Palestinian population there. They're slightly suppressed by a communal feeling of respect for those massacred on October the 7th and, and also a kind of togetherness that you know our boys and girls in the IDF are fighting now whether it's a good idea or not you know let's support them. So the public discourse I think is fairly seems fairly united, but I I wonder how long that that will last for. Well, thanks so much for all your reporting there, Henry. Can we talk about something else, a bit more sort of intra-Israeli politics? Many people, I think, outside Israel won't necessarily know the name Bezalel Smotrich. First of all, you can tell me if I've been pronouncing that correctly, but who is he and why is he making the news this week? Yeah, so um, I've I've been in Israel for a fortnight now, and every couple of days, this, this guy's name comes up. And you might think, well, fair enough, because he's the finance minister. You know, he's the, he's the equivalent of the Chancellor of the Exchequer here, here in Israel. But his name comes up because of he, basically the extremely hard line positions that he takes, and, and I think many will think provocative statements that he made. So, I mean, in, in the past, he said that he wants sterile zones for for areas around Jewish settlements. He wants segregated maternity wards. You know, why he says, should my wife have to give birth next to a, a, a Palestinian woman whose son will probably want to kill her in 20 years' time? That's that's one of the comments that he's made. Famously, uh, certainly in, inside Israel, he was arrested in 2005 on suspicion of preparing to blow up a motorway in protest at the sort of soft treatment as he saw it of Gazans. He, he was held for three weeks and, and then released without charge, we should say, and he's always denied planning to do that. But the reason he matters is that he he's the leader of the religious Zionist party. Um, he's not Likud. He's, he's to, to the right of Likud. And he props up Benjamin Netanyahu. Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't have a majority. And I think as well as just the fact that a lot of people will see the positions he's taking uh, and his his views of the Palestinians, who he doesn't think of as a legitimate people, as, as quite eye-catching and potentially shocking. It, it matters because... He, he has real influence in the government. And if you're trying to work out what the future of Gaza might be after the fighting stops, then you, you have to pay attention to what he says. And, and so we wanted to speak to him. So we asked to interview him. He didn't want to speak to us. I mean, I, I suppose he is quite a, quite a busy man and there is a war on. So the next best thing is we, well, we thought well, we, we want to visit his home. And, and he lives in a settlement in the West Bank, a few miles to the west of Nablus, it's called Kedumim. It's quite famous within Israel. A lot of settler firebrands have come from there over the years. People like Daniela Weiss, who's a big cheese in the in the Nachala movement, which is encouraging young Israeli couples to come out and settle in the in the West Bank, which under international law is is illegal. A lot of the these settlers are are, are very very religious and feel that they're re taking historic Israel and, and that it, it is God's plan that they do. And, and I think it's fair to say that Smotrich is one of them. So anyway, we, you don't just turn up to these settlements and, and go and knock on doors and chat to people there. We wanted to visit, but um, we were declined an invitation to visit. So we thought, well, you know, the next best thing to do is go and talk to his neighbours. 
go and talk to the the Palestinians who who live closest to this settlement. So that's that's what we did. Went to the uh, village of Kafir Kadur, which is just down the hill from Kedumim. Most most Palestinian villages are on lower ground than the Israeli settlements because traditionally the Palestinians didn't want to be on the top of the hill. It didn't sort of suit their farming practices. The economy there runs on olive farming mainly. And, and basically what they described to us was a process of, as they saw it, slow motion ethnic cleansing, a mixture of economic strangulation by Kedemim, the local settlement, aided by these kind of security militia called first responders and, they said, the IDF, and just outright physical intimidation. So mobs of settlers rampaging through the village, burning things, cutting down trees, and the locals, they don't really dare respond because the response they say from from the first responders and the IDF would just be so so heavy handed that it's that it's not really worth it. The big problem I think is is these access to these ancient olive groves that they've had in their families for for generations. I mean, large areas the settlers have just said you, you can't go there anymore, and and some of these people have learned the hard way that they can't. You know, we spoke to the mayor; his uncle was shot dead in two thousand and eight we were told for daring to go into his own olive grove it's a beautiful village old stone but but the the aesthetic of it is changing because the locals don't have the money to keep up these buildings so they let them fall into disrepair and build just really cheap alternatives instead you know all the cars are dented there are no hubcaps on them it it feels very dejected and th- they say this has got worse the violence the intimidation since Smotrich joined the government a year ago and and so you know it's possible to see this as a vision for for one of Smotridge's quote unquote sterile zones. There's no suggestion of trying to live amicably alongside the Palestinians, according to the Palestinians we spoke to, and, and we weren't able to speak to Smotridge, and we weren't able to speak to the settlers, even though we asked. And so, when you take that on the ground experience and you compare it to some of his positions vis-a-vis Gaza over the last few weeks, you know, he bitterly, bitterly opposed allowing fuel trucks in a couple of weeks ago even when you know other other people in the government said well look apart from anything else we need that we need to keep the sort of sanitation going for the israeli troops you know we don't want diseases spreading around gaza they won't be able to operate you know and even that wasn't enough for him he did eventually vote for the hostage release deal but after a lot of complaining and so it raises the question of what is his vision of a future of Gaza, not just one in, in which Israel physically controls it, but perhaps where the Palestinian people are there at all. He said that the most humanitarian, and that's a quote, solution would be the voluntary resettlement by Gazans to other countries. Basically, he thinks they should leave. And, and so when you, when you visit the area around his home in the West Bank, you can get the sense that he really means that. And so you've got him on the right of Benjamin Netanyahu, politically and then you've got the international community pulling Netanyahu in the other direction you know the UN wants to see the Palestinian Authority restated in Gaza and a a proper viable independent government for 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 the Palestinians there and you do have to wonder well when Netanyahu is being propped up by Smotridge and 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 others there's Itamar Ben-Gavir who's from a different faction he's the security minister he's also a settler which way Netanyahu will go and, and which way he can afford to go and, and what the future of Gaza is. So it was it was fascinating to meet these Palestinians who who live near. I mean, you, you can see the, the settlement, it's it's less than half a mile away, live near Smotridge and, and, and his like-minded people in Kedemim and, and, and hear their experience. Henry, you're leaving Israel now after, after how, how long have you been there? Been here a fortnight today. What are the memories that you'll take away? What are the, the stories, the people you've spoken to that you think will really uh, stick in your mind as you come back to the UK? I mean, I, I, I was in the um, informally renamed Hostage Square in, in Tel Aviv last night as the sun was going down, that big, long, empty table, families just weeping quietly to themselves, singing. You know, it, it, it is so desperately sad. And, 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 and actually, even though it's been a, a very... It's been a very positive story just seeing the footage of of these children being reunited with, with their parents just has brought home to me just how horrific it must have been in the first place. And, and then, of course, you you can't help thinking of what the Palestinians are going through in, in much greater numbers and just the general 
the general misery of it all. I think what, what's been really interesting is actually talking to what I would call the traditional moderate Israelis, people who are fully, fully believing of and, and invested in the state of Israel and, and, and its defense, but who are quite appalled really by the fact that, that October the 7th was allowed to happen and also the response now in Gaza. And one of them said to me, there are fewer and fewer of us in Israeli society. Israeli society is becoming more polarized and is becoming more hardline to this problem. So conversations like that will certainly stick with me. I, I don't think I leave particularly optimistic, I'm afraid. Henry, one final question from me then. For all of our listeners who are not in Israel, what would you want them to understand about what's happening on the ground? What is the one thing that you'd try and say, look, you'd really have to be here to sort of comprehend this or this or that? Well, I think that Israel and Israeli society is much more complicated, complex and, and nuanced than it appears from the West. There are real differences in, in views. So many of the communities that were that were completely massacred and taken apart on October the 7th, they, they for example, are the more peace-loving, more communitarian areas and, and there are more right-wing areas and so on. So I think just, just the fact that Israel is quite a complicated society and there are quite a lot of different views, which I think that impression is slightly suppressed at the moment because because what what you can say is that Israeli society is is traumatized by by what happened on October the seventh quite understandably, but yeah I think that's that's the, the the view that I would I try to tell people at home when I speak to them. Thank you so much, Henry Natalia Vasileva. What will you be looking at over the next few days, the next the next week? What do you think our audience should be paying attention to? Yeah, I think this weekend is going to be crucial because it's been seven days since Israel stopped its ground operation in Gaza. Now, initially, it was sold to the Israeli public as a pause because the, the pressure from hostages' families were growing to try and and save at least some of them. Basically, what's been happening in this country is every night, Israelis are, are stuck in front of their TV screen, in front of their computers and phones, and they see pictures of people coming out of hostility, uh, captivity, alive. I don't want to say safe and sound. I'm not sure about the sound part of it. But every night it's perceived as some sort of a miracle that those people survived the captivity, they survived the bombings, and they made back in one piece. And all of the while, if you look at the opinion polls, if you talk to people in the street, there was this idea that you know we need to try to save as many as we can but we also need to go back to the task of eliminating Hamas in Gaza. Now, that it looks like the longer that the hostage deal has been going on, the less appetite there is among Israeli publics for sort of this operation of revenge and focusing on what's happening in Gaza. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been issuing statement after statement in recent days saying that it's not over, we're going to get back to war. Please don't think that we gave up on it. But I, it looks like this weekend we might become at a point when the Israeli government might feel pressure both from inside and outside the country to agree to a more lasting truce, to agree to a broader deal, to try to negotiate something that would bring back more hostages and that might stop hostilities in Gaza indefinitely. Again, I, I, I just said internally and externally because A, as I've said, there might be extra pressure from Israeli public who saw the results of that deal and who saw all of those people walking back alive. And there also might be pressure from, from the United States. You know, we, we have Anthony Blinken visiting Israel this week for the third time since the attack happened. And we know that the American administration has been pushing for a lasting truce. So we're just going to see how, how it pans out this weekend. Thank you, Natalia and Henry. They are the forgotten hostages. Women and children have been released over the past few days from the hell of captivity in Gaza. But many of the men, kidnapped on October the 7th, remain behind. To date, more than 100 of them have now spent 54 days trapped at gunpoint underground. With the current truce precarious, the window of opportunity to negotiate the release of the Israeli men is diminishing all the time. On Wednesday, families of young men held hostage travelled from Israel to London to visit the Telegraph offices where they made a very public plea to get them back. Orit Meyer knows her son Almog is at the back of the queue in any negotiations. Here, she's joined by Aviram Meyer, Almog's uncle. 
The interview was conducted by my colleagues Chief Reporter Rob Mendick and Senior Video Producer Jack Leather. You can also watch this interview on The Telegraph's YouTube channel. Here's that conversation. It's about uh, telling our story. It's happened. This is our life now. It's reality. I want you to see a, a mother and an uncle. I, I want you to know how is my day, our day look like. Because it was different in the October 6th. It was different. My life changed completely. Uh, we wanted everyone to uh, wake up in the morning and will ask himself what I do, what, what I'm going to do for the hostages. Think about your son is there. It, it can happen in every, every family, in every place. Think about your, your, your child. You know where is your child sleep. You know what he is doing during the day. But I don't know. I know that my son is in the Hamas. I don't know if he sleep, if he eat, if he's, I, I, I know nothing about him. The only, the only thing I know that the, the, the army confirmed is that my son is kidnapped. That's the only thing I know. Do, do you worry that there is a window of opportunity to get the hostages out that is perhaps closing or that you worry about that? Yes, I'm worried. First of all, I'm happy for the families and the hostages who released or got released. Very happy for them. But I want my, ba my baby back. I want my son back. 54 days, it's too much. Too much. And, and do you worry that the men are being forgotten? Because obviously they're releasing women That's what children. we see, because only the women and the children went out. And we've been in the Israeli embassy in a press conference. And next to us sat Thomas Hahn, the father of uh, Emily, that his daughter have been released. And in this conference, we told Thomas in front of cameras that she prefer that his daughter will be released before her son. I saw it, I, was, I, I told him to, I don't know how can, how can I be able to look at you while your daughter will be free and my son not. When was the last time you spoke to Almog? In October 7th, he called me in the morning at 7.45 a.m. And he said to me, Mom, they closed the festival. There are rockets and, and shooting all over. Uh, I'm hiding. I'll call you every half an hour. Mom, I love you. This was the last call from him. Since then, we don't, uh, I didn't hear from him. But a few hours later, I got a video clip. And Almog was, I recognized my son in the video clip that the Hamas published. So he was lying with the other four young guys. Uh, he was lying on the floor. They were beaten. They were tight by their hands, and my son uh, covered his face with his hands, and he was frightened. And you've heard nothing since? No. The, the army confirmed that he is uh, an hostage, yes. What is Almog like as a human being, as a person, as a son? Almog always, always smile, smile on his face all the time. <sighs> He's an happy guy. He's full of energy. This is his vibe, like this all the time, moving, doing things, 
sociable, lots of friends. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine him, how he's coping now when he's uh, in the channel or wherever he is. He's full of energy. I don't know how he managed it. I don't know. Can you sleep at night? Hardly. Hardly. I even can't concentrate driving. I, I can't drive. All the time, all my thinking is about it. Hard. Very hard. Do you feel the West is doing enough to help get him out? Do you think enough is being done? Okay. Um, it's very short. No. Disappointingly, no. As I understand, we share the same values with the West. Liberal values. And I have to tell you, Almog came to the party with friends. They tried to escape. After the phone call, they tried to escape. In the car entered two sisters and a friend, the driver. They couldn't, they couldn't get away from the, from the ground because uh, it was traffic jam there and the bullets of uh, the murderers arrived and they had to escape for the car. The car exploded, by the way, and the two girls ran away together while they are calling their father, and he talked with them for an hour and a half, the sisters. The murderers murdered them while he is hearing the voices and the last breath of his daughter. The driver ran away to another direction from Almog, called his parents. From there, we knew about what happened in the car. And he was murdered a while after the phone call. The bodies of Tomer and the two sisters criminated. They have been murdered joyfully, with happiness. And they criminated the bodies. It took to the army more than two weeks to identify the bodies through the teeth. This behavior we cannot accept. We have to demolish this kind of behavior. And I can't understand why the West, who share the same values, doesn't stand all together and says we are not agree to live with this kind of behavior. In that specific event, there's nothing political. This is pure humanitarian. To take girls, older people, from their beds with their pajama, without shoes, it's something that we can't accept. And if you don't share the West, share those values, so say it. Say it, declare it. Because we don't understand what's going on here. This kind of event happened last time in the Holocaust. And it will be the last time. It won't, it won't, be happen, it won't happen again. We can't accept it. With the West or without the West. I demand that the, the, the Red Cross will go and visit them and give them the medicines they need. There are lots of hostages that need the medicine. I don't know if my son is alive. I want to know what is situation. I demand that they will go inside. They don't do the job. They have a role which they don't 
don't do. They are not functioning. From our point of view, they are not functioning. All they have to do is tell us what is the medical situation of the hostages. Have been passed 54 or 55 days. Where the hell are you? Who needs the Red Cross if it's, if it's not doing its role? But when you see, and I don't know if you have seen, but protests on the streets of London that are pro-Palestinian and chanting from the river to the sea, what does that make you feel, given what you've gone through or still going through? I feel bad with this. It's very hard for me because this is my reality. My son went to celebrate in a festival and he didn't come home. It's happened. And uh, it's hard for me to see what's going on on the streets. Very hard for me. In Israel, are they doing enough to get him out? Is Netanyahu doing enough? We, we support the, the military operation. I think that without the military operation, uh, there was no deal with the hostages. We have to press the, the Hamas, we have to press their supporters, we have to press the Qatar government to continue the negotiations. We have to press, by the way, the UK government to support all those kinds of uh, steps that, uh, that we do. I really want my prime minister to say clearly that the subject of the hostages is the most important thing uh, that uh, the government has to do. He doesn't say it, unfortunately. He says that the uh, hostages and demolishing the Hamas, it's the two goals. I have no problem with the two goals. I just want priority for the hostages because we know that the hostages won't hold up. The Hamas demolish can, be, can wait a bit. With each passing day, how much extra... Does, does it get worse? Does the pain get worse or does it get less? Yes, it's harder. Now it's harder. As, as much as it takes, Time, it's harder for me, for us. Because we, all the time, we are working a lot. We decided to, to get out from the house. There are families that can't uh, go out. They can't uh, tell their stories. But we, from the beginning, uh, did it. And now, I feel... Uh, that uh, I'm weaker, I'm, I'm weaker, that uh, I need uh, lots of strength. Because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 it's hard. It, I, I have an empty, uh, empty room. So, yes, it's getting harder. What you just started to say that uh, 75% of the families of the hostages are not functioning. They didn't start to digest the situation. So they can't take it out, they can't tell the story. And there are few families who are taking it on their shoulders. And um, here you see three families who are doing this job, but uh, the others uh, just don't live. Is there, is there communication with all the families or, you know, is there some form where you can all talk to each other and help each other? Yes. And offer support? Yes, there is a form. We need, we meet there we talk, we share feelings, and we do things together. We do lots of things together. For example, uh, unfortunately, in the 7th of December, it will be two months. 
and the 7th of the December, it's first candle of Hanukkah. The symbol of Hanukkah is uh, uh, bringing light into the darkness. So we want to combine an event that will deal with it for the hostages. So this is, uh, we initiating it through the forum, the family forum, and, and there probably will be very a big event. Now stages of time are more shorter for everything. We decided to come to London three days ago. Usually you decide to go to London three months before, two months before, uh, producing event, big event with thousands of people take us three days to, to produce. Everything is shorter, everything is more extreme, and the feelings also more extreme. You can see Orit in a very good shape in one minute, and she's breaking up in the other minute, and pull herself together to the third minute. Yeah. So the roller coaster is very extreme, and as long as the time passes, it has new edges to the roller coaster. I wanted that uh, another mother will come with us, but uh, most of them want to stay now at home because they release hostages and they maybe. But the men, there is no prospect at the moment of the men, young men being released. That must be hard. It's pain, yeah. It's hard. It's hard. But he's my boy and I want him back. You know, we, we don't open news. I don't watch TV. It's better, it's better for me not, uh, not to see all the fake news on TV. And, and actually, I, I want to tell you that I don't, I don't get any information about what's, what's happening in a political situation. In negotiation. Everything in negotiation. Everything is from the news. So it's better for me to close, to close TV and uh, the families talk. We are in a group together. Yeah. The, so all the, the details are from the, our group. The, the most uh, safe news or correct news coming from the family forum group. And uh, this is what we read. Because everything else would give you false hope or false worry and so on. They, they talk about everything. So every, every rumor tears our heart. So uh, we prefer not to deal with it. We prefer to disconnect, yeah. and when something serious will come, we would be happy to, to, to hear and to deal with it. But all the rumors are terrible for us. And you remain optimistic, or your mood changes? And I am optimistic. I'm full of hope. I, I believe it will... He will go out, he release, but uh, yeah, I believe he release. But till then, I and we are working. I don't think too much. This is at least my way to deal with the situation. I don't think too much. I'm not trying to uh, think about what will happen if and uh, what can be happen or what can't be happen, I'm bringing the awareness of Almog and the hostages to the world. This is my job now, this is what I do. At night, it's a little bit different, but during the day, I'm not giving to it uh, too much attention. I'm trying to do everything to bring him back. I'm full of hope he will come back. And I know that till he will come back. We won't stop. We won't stop. We won't give up. And we know it gives him strength. And we got strength from him. So we won't give up. He will come back with all the hostages. Alive. Alive. 
Almog, if you see me now, we love you. All the family, everyone, your friends, everyone. We do everything to bring you back home soon. Be strong. Be strong. Love you. Battle Lines is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our news, analysis and dispatches from the ground in Israel and Gaza, subscribe to The Telegraph or sign up to Dispatches, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from contributors to this podcast. If you appreciated the podcast, please consider following Battle Lines on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. As disinformation is a particular problem during conflict, we are relying on your support more than ever. Battle Lines is part of wider Telegraph foreign coverage in our podcasts. If you're interested in finding out more about the war in Ukraine, you can listen to Battle Lines' sister podcast, Ukraine the Latest. This episode of Battle Lines was produced by me, David Knowles, and executive producer, Louisa Wells.